Good afternoon, everyone. Delightful to continue our journey on Sashin and uh, studying and practicing Dharma together. <clears throat> Wonderful to see so many of you joining online and certainly all the uh, in-person folks as well. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, the title of the Dharma talk is, and I didn't make this up, but the title of the Dharma talk is Appreciate Your Life. And I'm taking that directly from uh, this beautiful book by uh, Maizumi Roshi, Appreciate Your Life. So um, I thought it was particularly, I thought it was particularly germane to spend some time talking about the teachings of Maizumi Roshi. And I'll tell you where this thought sort of bounced into my head. In the morning for service, we are chanting the, uh, the long version of the ancestors of our tradition. And at a point, I thought, wow, this is all about lineage. And I think as Zen practitioners and students and ordained and, and, and all the different places that we, we fill and occupy in the center, lineage is extremely important for us to understand and, and practice. It's not this sort of stagnant historical document that we just sort of chant the names and then we're, we, you know, we're on to breakfast. What I'm going to encourage us to do this morning is to really deeply consider the power and the privilege of being part of a living tradition, being part of a lineage of teaching and instruction. So lineage is another way of saying we're honoring our ancestors. And um, we recognize that we can't do this alone, right? We try, and what do we keep coming back to? We need teachers, we need authentic teachings, we need sangha, and we need our own intention. We need our own aspiration to, um, to realize these teachings, to put them into practice, to experience them in a very, very personal and deep way. So I wanted to take a few moments to talk about lineage because, you know, Maizumi Roshi, is a lineage ancestor. And you can think of lineage, and all, all sects and sections, uh, all lineages of Buddhism have a historical um, transmission and a record of historical uh, uh, teachers and ancestors. So a lineage is another way of saying it's a line of transmission. So it's, it, it goes back to the Buddha. It goes back 2,600 years. So I got really excited when I was preparing for this talk. I sat down with our sutra book and I thought, I need to count the lineage, the long version, and, and see how many, how many ancestors are preceding us as we're sitting here today, this morning. So, in the male lineage, we have the past seven Buddhas. Okay, so this goes back 2,600 years. So I want us to wrap our mind around that, that this is, um, there, there is something so potent to the, to the historical context as well as the living, breathing lineage of instruction. So we have the past seven Buddhas. This is the male lineage, past seven Buddhas, 26 Indian ancestors, 22 Chinese ancestors, 30 Japanese ancestors, and one American ancestor. Now, I took this from the sutra book, so forgive me if I, if I have any errors. And then the female lineage has 50 plus female nuns, uh, charyas in that lineage. lineage coming right up to where we sit today, coming through Bernie Glassman, who is the first American ancestor, all of his successors, our dear teachers, Roshi and Sensei, and soon to be Michael Shikan Bruner. This is lineage. 
And I don't know about you, but lineage is profound, profound. Because we can trust, we can trust in the sacredness and the authenticity of the teachings. You know, traditionally, um, lineage uh, is, is sort of handed down, and, and not traditionally, it continues to this day, enlightened master, student, enlightened master teacher to a devoted practitioner disciple. So it's very personal, it's very intimate. And it's brought to us with this generosity of spirit and accuracy and authenticity. It's why when we are part of a living tradition and lineage, when we hear the Dharma, when we read the Dharma, when we practice the Dharma, it sparks something for us because it's a living tradition. You know, you can read a lot of books that might be interesting, that might have some, you know, words of wisdom, but I don't know about you, it doesn't catch me the same way as when I'm part of a living tradition, as when I'm part of the succession of living past ancestors and teachers. So, if we think about lineage itself, it's very dynamic and inspiring. And I want to encourage us to not just see it as names on a paper in a sutra book, or names that we encounter when we read our Dharma texts, but to actually appreciate what is being given to us. Profound generosity over 2,600 years. All of these lineage masters got up and sat, sat in caves, sat in temples, sat in monasteries, sat on the side of Mast Vulture's Mountain, Buddha Shakyamuni giving many, many sutras and uh, tantra, or sutra, sutra teachings. So we think all of the ancestors that preceded us, their dedication, their good heart, their wish to maintain the Dharma, the precious lineage that we have, to nourish it, to train disciples, for disciples to be interested. So I, I think it keeps us from sort of going on autopilot, doesn't it? To just think, well, the Zendo's here, it'll always be here. The teachings are here. If the Zendo's not here, I can crack open a book, right? We can get a little complacent if we don't really appreciate the profundity of a lineage, an authentic, traditional lineage. So how do we maintain lineage? It's not just our teachers. It's not just our, our, our Roshis and our sensates. We all have a responsibility in it as well. Whether we're lay, ordained, whether we have a wish to work towards authentic transmission, we all carry a responsibility to help the Dharma flourish by recognizing that we are part of a living tradition. What will we do to maintain this tradition? How will we help Dharma flourish? Doesn't just happen automatically, right? 2,600 years of teachings and teachers and enlightened masters passing their knowledge, their wisdom, their compassion to interested disciples, to, to committed and dedicated practitioners. That's how it happens. So we have this opportunity now to train our minds and our heart to realize some of the most profound teachings, I think, that exist. Thanks to the lineage, the living lineage and tradition of instruction. So I want to encourage you to ask yourself, what's my responsibility to preserve, to maintain, to nourish this lineage? The Soto Zen, White Plum Sangha, this is part of our lineage. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. And here's where I think is the real payoff. When we appreciate lineage and make it come alive, not just see it, again, as names on a, on a paper, when we appreciate lineage, it deepens our faith. 
and faith can sometimes be a scary word for people, um, but faith is just about belief, isn't it? It's a strong belief that what you are studying and practicing is true, is genuine is valid because we may not have a direct experience yet of a particular teaching so our faith that that teaching is authentic we talked about that yesterday in the three dharma seals and i'll do a quick review of that because i want to share something from um taizan maizumi roshi's book it gives us an opportunity to recognize and acknowledge that what we're studying and practicing is Buddha's truth. That's what the lineage is offering to us. We can decide how we're going to take it, and we can decide what we're going to do with it. And we can decide if, if it really ignites us or lights us on fire. But if you think of the kindness, you know, there's a lot of people in our lives right now in this very life that have been generous to us, that have shared things about particular subjects or have shared their knowledge, have shared their kindness. And we have gratitude, don't we? But, but what about a lineage that has lasted over 2,600 years? How do we develop a deep gratitude for what is being now put directly in our laps? We don't have to hike up the Himalayas to get it, right? <laughs> we don't have to go through unbelievable hardship. We don't have to sit in a cave for 12 years, as Jetson Palman, Palmo did, uh, the first Tibetan nun that was ordained by the Dalai Lama. She went into solitary retreat for 12 years in the Himalayas in a cave by herself. We don't have to do that. Can you think of any greater kindness than the way that our teachers have brought the lineage to us, our Roshi, our Sensei, that have, have helped develop it according to modern times, according to our, our culture, our mores, our abilities, our capacities. We don't have to travel exorbitant distances to find teachers. So I think that's part of appreciating the lineage. And as we do this, we realize the authenticity of these teachings. We don't have to second guess, is this true? I mean, we can ask ourselves that question because what's the opposite of faith? Doubt. But you can have doubt that sort of tends towards the truth. We can sit with something and think, mm, I don't know yet, but I'm going to keep an open mind and an open heart. And faith is really our direct experience of the teachings, isn't it? It's when we directly experience and acknowledge something that it deepens our faith in a, particular, um, in a particular teaching, in a particular lineage. So we can ask ourselves, have we benefited from being a recipient of this lineage? In what ways have we benefited? So make it very, very personal. Don't just see it as this abstract document that you can read in books or, or, or chant during our, our service, our liturgy. Make it very personal. What does this mean to me that I'm sitting here after 2,600 years receiving some of the most profound teachings I could ever hope to receive? How have I benefited? How has it changed my life? What do I want to do with it? So it's not dull and fixed and historical. I, you know, when I was in school and university, I, I was not a fan. Like, history was not one of my most exciting subjects. So I thought, ah, it's in the past, right? I, I'm interested in knowing about it, but it's, it's past. But as I've studied Buddhist lineage, and I think it's alive. It's living and breathing in our zendo right now. Our ancestors are with all of you in your homes, your books, your altars, everything that you're thinking about, studying and practicing, it's alive. It's expanding our capacity, our hearts. It's opening our minds. So see it as a living and breathing 
um, instrument, if you will. So our Soto lineage evolved from Buddha's teachings 2,600 years ago in India. Okay, I want to give you just a little historical perspective. Even though I said history is not my strong suit, I had to actually write it down. 600 years later, it went to China. So it's known as Chan Buddhism. And in the 12th century, Japanese masters and teachers sent Buddhist monks, um, Dogen, which we're all very familiar with, and Issei, to study Chinese Buddhism. And they, I mean, can you only imagine the hardships they endured? And then Dogen returned to transmit the lineage. Dogen returned to Japan to transmit the lineage of Soto Zen, and it came to North America after the Second World War. So in Appreciate Your Life, if you haven't read this book, please read it. And if you've read it, please read it again. It's, it's such a beautiful book. And um, I learned a lot about my Zumi Roshi. Um, you know, if, if you have other questions, Roshi and Sensei can give you, I'm sure, many, many stories, lively stories and otherwise, about my Zumi Roshi and his kindness in coming to the United States and helping Dharma flourish. So Maizumi Roshi was um, in a prominent Soto Zen family. And this is what made it come alive for me today, quite honestly. In one of the, one of the uh, names that we chant in the male lineage, the Japanese male lineage, uh, is Bayan Hakuju Kuroda, which is Maizumi Roshi's father. His name is in our lineage. Maizumi Roshi took his mother's name instead of Maizumi, uh, instead of Kuroda, he took, um, you know, Taizen Maizumi. And he received Dharma transmission from his father at 24 years old. 24. I was trying to think what I was doing at 24. <laughs> Nothing good. <laughs> Nothing interesting. <laughs> Usual post-college stuff. <laughs> the hijinks that people get into, you know, groveling for a job and entertaining ourselves and just being caught up in distraction. And I'm thinking, 24 years old, my Zumi Roshi received, full, received transmission from his father. And then he was sent to the U.S. So can you imagine language, culture, societal norms, <clears throat> in LA, founded the Zen Center of Los Angeles, which Roshi and Sensei uh, were a part of and have very, very close connections to. But he continued studying with Koryo Roshi in Japan. So during a year when he had to finish his, his studies, Bernie Glassman took over the Zen Center of Los Angeles until Maizumi Roshi returned. So Maizumi Roshi was authorized to teach from three different teachers, his father, um, Yasutani, and Koryo Roshi. So his father and Yasutani Roshi, all on our founder's altar. I was like staring at the pictures yesterday and this morning thinking, oh my gosh, there, there are so many gems here that if we really just let it touch our heart, Will, will inspire us in ways that are just phenomenal. And our koan study, Koryo Roshi was of the Rinzai sect. So Maizumi kind of melded both of the, the Soto and Rinzai sect. So he was authorized to teach, built teachings, and <clears throat> died in 1995 when Bernie Glassman, he, Maizumi Roshi had 12 successors, 12 Dharma successors in the US. Bernie Glassman was his first. And the name White Plum Lineage, when I saw this, I was like really touched because lineage is personal. It's personal. And the White Plum Lineage got its name because my Zumi Roshi's father loved white plum trees. Do you see how lineage comes alive? It's not just history. It's not just names on a page. It, it comes alive. I fear I'm going to run out of time today. <laughs> Uh-oh. 
So I want to give you a little bit of uh, inspiration um, from the foreword that was written by Bernie Glassman about Maizumi Roshi in Appreciate Your Life. And this is what I think hugely important for us as modern day Zen practitioners searching for truths and watching the teachers that come before us. The breadth of one teacher's lineage doesn't tell us everything. It doesn't tell about the challenges they and others met in transmitting the teachings from one vastly different culture to another. Nowadays, with private centers sprouting up in every major city across the US, each with its own style and flavor, it's easy to underestimate and even misunderstand the achievements of these Zen pioneers. And Bernie Glassman in the forward said, when Maizumi my, my Roshi had a very clear approach to bringing the teachings to his, his students from east to west, and he said, I love this, taste as much of this as you can. Swallow what you need and spit out the rest. So he was aware of the cultural differences, the different contexts, Japanese culture, American culture, the, the ways in which we want to practice or we do practice. So taste as much of this as you can, swallow what you need, and spit out the rest. And Bernie Glassman said later on in the foreword that when he died in 1995, he had done what he had set out to do. He had brought the Buddha Dharma to the West, and he had seen it take root. He knew better than anyone else, if it was to flower, it would have to chart new courses and develop in new ways. And he would not be the one to do that because he was Japanese. So we can be very, very thankful, can't we, that we have Western teachers we, who understand Western culture, who understand the unique capacities and traditions and uh, challenges that we have that continue to bring the Dharma forward. And one of the things that he said to his students again and again, your life is the treasury of the true Dharma eye and subtle mind of peace. Your life is the life of the Buddha. Wow. You know, that's really a lot to sit with, isn't it? Do we have those thoughts as we're driving to the center, as we're driving to work, as we're driving to the grocery store? My life is the life of the Buddha. How am I going to help it flourish? What will I do in my own little way to transmit the Dharma? Again, it's informally, right? There are very formal ceremonies, which Roshi and Shikan and Sensei and, uh, and, and others are in, involved in. But informally, we have a responsibility. How do we help others? Is it just by our words? Or is it by the example that we lead? The way in which we live our life that helps others to, to look and say, what do you got going on? What, you're not, you don't seem to get as angry. You don't seem to be as, as, as frustrated. You, you seem to be more content with what you have. And then we can talk a little bit about what, what, our, what our journey has been. It's not about proselytizing at all. It's not about you know, bringing people books and, and set, setting them up for Dharma that way. It's just simply living our life honestly and authentically with integrity, with responsibility, understanding that we are now in the age of, of this particular time in our lineage of transmission, 2,600 years and going. What do we want to leave for future generations? You know, there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful prayer that says, I know I'll probably not get it right, it's about bodhicitta, which is the, the heart of, uh, of compassion, of enlightenment. You know, may the precious bodhicitta flourish. 
May it increase where it has not yet grown, and where it has grown, may it flourish. Well, who's going to help it flourish? I see some pretty amazing practitioners online and sitting here, and I've been meeting some very, very amazing people, good-hearted, dedicated, compassionate, kind. Yes, we have our faults. Yes, we have our imperfections. But I see some amazing practitioners. How will we help the Dharma flourish? We show gratitude for the lineage, don't we? We show gratitude for the lineage. We recognize we're not alone. The lineage follows us. The lineage, is, the lineage is given to us. We read a book, and maybe we start in anything that we read or what we, what we listen to, and we give thanks. We show gratitude that we now have capacity to receive these teachings. We have faculties, mental and otherwise, to receive these teachings, to not take it lightly. So before I go on to share something in this book, I wanted to share a couple things in here. I, oh, gosh. So my Zumi Roshi actually wrote, and, and this book, Appreciate Your Life, was part of his Teishos during Sashin, which over the course of his um, lifetime, he gave over 1,500 Teishos. And Teisho is a word that's used as, it's actually... Um, the direct experience that a teacher has imparting that to their students. Um, so I'm not giving a Tasha, I'm giving a Dharma talk because <laughs> I'm still working <laughs> on getting the, uh, you know, uh, realizing the, uh, the true nature of things. So, um, but, but 1,500 teachings. And one of the teachings that he gave was on the Dharma seals that we talked about yesterday. And he did it in a page and a half. It took me a lot longer to, to, to put that out. But briefly, um, the Dharma seals are the authentic teachings of the Buddha. And the Dharma seals permeate every single teaching we receive, we read, we study, we practice. They're the authentic teachings of the Buddha. So the three Dharma seals we talked about yesterday was impermanence which is recognizing the co continuous flow of things, that everything is, is, is in continuous flux, including our bodies, objects, bodies. Things change slowly, they change quickly. Remember we talked about the intellect alone is not going to help us awaken to the understanding of impermanence. Intellect alone will only get us stuck in permanence. We also talked about no self, which is the idea that if things are constantly changing, how can there be a fixed sense of self? How can you not be changing if everything is changing around you, right? And we know this. Our direct experience tells us that is not true. I am changing. But, but we sort of ascribe that there's something, there's something uh, that's called an I in the center of our experiences that doesn't change. But that's contrary to Buddha's truth. So, um, you know, em emptiness tells us it's an absence of separation. Everything is, is possible in this, in this rich state, this expansive, spacious state. And then we also talked about nirvana, which uh, is a third seal, which is translated really as peace. So there's a lot of colloquialisms about nirvana, you know, like uh, it's a blissed out state, or I'm so, you know, you've heard that, I'm so blissed out, um, I, I'm, I'm in a beautiful vacation location, this is nirvana. But nirvana, according to Buddha's teachings, is about a particular kind of freedom from ideas and concepts and notions. Even ideas about impermanence and no self. Because right now, impermanence and no self, they're still, they're, they're still they're skillful means to get us to, to looking deeply into the true nature of things, but they're still constructs. So we don't want to get stuck anywhere. We want to continue to develop, you know, as, as we said yesterday, 
what Thich Nhat Hanh said, the more that we look deeply into the nature of impermanence, no self, and nirvana, we touch the peace of our true nature. So um, that, that's kind of the recap of what we spent with yesterday. And now let me share, uh, the, this almost brought me to tears when I was reading this last night and this morning. It just, it's incredible. So in the, in the chapter on the Dharma seals, uh, Maizumi Roshi starts out by saying, practice can be described in four steps. Four steps, folks. The first, listen to the Dharma. How do you listen? We know we listen with our ears. He says you can also listen with your eyes. So how do we listen to the Dharma? Are we listening to the Dharma? Are we deeply attentive and listening? So that was one. He said, next, reflect upon the teachings that you have heard. Reflect. You know, don't just read and say, what's next, what's next? This is one of my faults because I have a mountain of books, and I, I love Dharma books, and I buy Dharma books, and they're my good, good friends and companions, and they just line my office at home and my meditation space. But when I read this, I thought, reflect upon the teachings that you have heard. So take some time. Slow down. Think about it. Maybe talk about it with sangha, with, with loved ones. Reflect on it. Don't be in a hurry to get on to the next teaching. What's next? What's next? What's next? And then he said, the next step, if you think the teachings are true, if you're reading and you think, this is valid. I, I connect to this. This Something resonates for me. Then my Zumi Roshi said, then the next step is to practice. Work with the teachings. He said, there are all kinds of teachings, and even when you practice them, the important points may not be clear to you. <laughs> Anyone else experience that, that lack of clarity? <laughs> he said, so confirm them. The fourth step is confirm them through your practice. Experience them. Don't just take it on hearsay. Don't just take it from the book. Experience it. How are you going to experience impermanence directly? Remember, we talked about that yesterday. How do you make it part of your daily practice? What is it that you, that you reflect on? What is it that you do? What can you get in the habit of to bring impermanence into your daily practice? He said, Maizumi Roshi said, the life in our heads, the life we think is our life, is not our real life. Our real life is the life of everything and everyone. We constantly talk about doing this and doing that, about things already gone or yet to come. We play with our life in our heads. This is not our real existence. We shouldn't mix this up. And he said, he's not devaluing thoughts. Just do not, this is key, just to me, just do not mix up what we think with what actually is. Just do not mix up what we think with what actually is. Because he said, Buddha said that everything is constantly changing. Constant change is real life and therefore unknowable. We're constantly changing, so Maizumi Roshi said, so we're unknow unknowable. He said, the no-self is not attached to anything, so it can work with everything. No-self is not attached to anything, so it can work with everything. And then he asks a question. Do you understand impermanence, this no fixed thing, which is no self? 
When you do not see this no self, suffering is waiting for you. When you see that nothing is fixed, there is peace. I love that he asked that question. I could just imagine being like, you know, in front of my Zumi Roshi asks the question, you think, yikes, do I understand impermanence? No fixed thing. So he says very clearly, there's the relationship between, between permanence and suffering. And my Zumi Roshi is giving us an opportunity to think more deeply about that. Do you understand impermanence, this no fixed thing, which is no self, when you don't see it? Suffering is waiting for you. And we know that, right? When change happens and we don't like it, we suffer. When change happens and we want it to be a different way, we suffer. If we started to taste the, the teaching of impermanence, then maybe we suffer less until we don't suffer at all because we've achieved nirvana, freedom, what, what is also called extinction of concepts. Can you even imagine that? Can you even imagine that? I hope to. I, I hope you imagine that, because that's, that's what we start with, isn't it? So he said the three, different, the three Dharma seals are not three different things, but rather one thing, your life from three different perspectives. He said, impermanence is an encouragement for our practice. When you understand impermanence, you understand the nature of suffering and no self. When you understand no self, that is the peace of nirvana. So the continual encouragement to listen to teachings, reflect on them, practice them, and finally experience them was throughout his book. And I think it's such a profound way to look at how do we do that? What is our methodology, if you will? How do we listen? How do we practice? How do we experience it? So you can see where lineage really helps us. Um, lineage really helps us sort of understand that while I'm still struggling to experience it, it's coming from a very deep truth. So I can trust that. I can rely on that. That's what the reliance on the three jewels, the three treasures is all about, right? We rely on the Buddha. We rely on Dharma. We rely on Sangha. Because we're all, we're all in this together. We're all trying to understand, to deeply realize uh, the teachings of Buddha, to be able to put them into practice, not just intellectually. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, that intellectual understanding alone is just that. It's just knowledge. And that's not unimportant. Believe me, it's not unimportant. But it is just knowledge. Direct experience takes us to the other shore, doesn't it? Direct experience the here and now, constantly, constantly being encouraged, enlivened. You know that old saying that we all have heard time and time again, practice as if your hair is on fire, as if your house is on fire. So the final piece that I want to share from Izumi Roshi's, the first Teisho that he, that he gave that was written in this book is actually called Appreciate Your Life. So this is it, folks. This is the place that we can put the pedal to the metal. When we deeply understand that we have this one short life to practice, however many years are left, and we start to really be enlivened with the notion of death and impermanence, does that in fact energize us to practice in ways that carry us to places that we have yet to go. We feel our hearts open. So Maizumi Roshi says, no one can live your life except you. You are responsible. But what is our life? What is our death? 
So I've got to tell you a funny story. It's not funny. Well, it is funny. But it's, a, it's one of my favorite Tibetan stories about the idea of appreciating our life and recognizing the, the power and the profundity of this life that we have. And so uh, there was a legless man called Druku Shewu. And he was on a ledge. Now you can pick apart this story like, what's a legless man doing on a, on a ledge of a mountain? <laughs> Don't go there. See how it applies to bring, bring these stories home. That's what the richness of Zen stories and Buddha's stories are all about, making it apply to your life right here and now. So anyhow, Druku Shewu's no legs. He's on the edge of a cliff. Here comes a galloping horse. Druku Shewu falls off, lands right on the back of the horse. And he's hanging on for dear life. And the horse is galloping and riding through the village. And the villagers are saying, get off, get off. And Druku Shewu says, when does a legless man have a chance to have a ride like this? No, I'm staying on until I fall off. I mean, that's our life, isn't it? In essence, we're, we're, we're legless. We have fallen into the seed of Dharma. We have discovered this beautiful Zendo, our, 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 our abbots, co-abbot, our Roshi, our sensei, our soon-to-be baby Buddha being born as sensei. This has fallen in our lap. We have fallen in its lap, right? It's, it's here catching us. And so we can appreciate the profundity of that. You didn't just see a flyer one day and think, okay, I'm gonna check out the Zen Center. These are very, very deep aspirations that we have all been cultivating for a long, long time. And now we have fallen off the cliff. We're on a wild ride, aren't we? Aren't some of these teachings in some ways pretty wild? Like you think, really? But hold on for dear life, folks. We're all riding these, these horses. And we, and we can support each other. Our teachers are giving us the instruction. So Maizumi Roshi, in this chapter on Appreciate Your Life, and it's one of the main teachings on, on death and impermanence. Like one of the ways that <clears throat> death and impermanence sort of uh, jolted me a little bit was um, a lot of times it's compared to the imprints of an elephant as it's walking the ground. You know, if, if you see the imprints that an elephant le leaves in dirt, it's pretty deep, isn't it? Like, like it's, it's really deep. And a lot of times the teachings on death and impermanence are likened to that, that the ways in which it can affect, profoundly affect our life, our aspirations, our intentions is there for the taking. Again, not just intellectually, we all know we're gonna die. We know things pass. We know life is short. We talked about this yesterday. We know this, we know this. How can we know this? How can we know this? You know, the beautiful Gatha that Thich Nhat Hanh wrote yesterday, in 300 years, where will you be? Where will I be? That's 300 years. How about five years? How about one year? Do we ever think that we won't make it home tonight? Might not wake up tomorrow? No, we think I've got a lot of time. First, I gotta do this, then I gotta do that. Oh, time to wash my car. Oh, then I'll sit down and study Dharma. Oh. Got to clean the house. Oh, and I'm not saying those aren't important. I like washing my car. But let's, let's put it in perspective and have, have balance, right? My Zumi Roshi is saying, do not be dualistic because that's what's blocking our realization of appreciating our life, of impermanence, no self. He said, if we remain in the confinement of duality, you know, the either ors, good or bads, this or that, you or me. He said, we're swayed by such opposing values as right and wrong, good and bad. These are only temporary aspects. Something appears to be good or bad, right or wrong, long or short, 
But what is it overall? It's just temporary. It's temporary. And he says the same thing with our life. We must see what it is beyond duality. Our life literally comes down to right now. Now, here, what is it? So he included a quote from Dogen Zenji, who said that living a long life without awareness is almost a crime. He said, if, if you even live one day with a clear understanding of what life is, the value of that one day is equal to many, many years of living without awareness. Because we're all so concerned with how long we will live, not how we're living not how we're using our time to open our hearts, to benefit others, to transmit Buddha's teachings in whatever way is available to us, whatever way we understand it. We don't have to be scholars. We don't have to be ordained. We don't have to be Zen masters. We just, we are. We're enjoying this path. We're deepening our understanding and our practice. And we can share that as appropriate. So it's beautiful, isn't it? We're so concerned with how long we'll live, but not how we're living. Do we check in from day to day? How did today go? You know, I, I try to do this little practice at night, um, not during Sashin oftentimes, because I'm so tired that I, I can't participate in my, what I call evening review, where I just try to go through some of my events of the day to kind of check in with myself, to sort of hold myself accountable. How did this go, Yogetsu? Ah, not so good. I could have done a little bit better there. Okay, that was pretty good. You know, not, not to have show any error, but just to sort of realize that we're doing a lot of things that are beneficial, that are coming from a place of wisdom and compassion. And we're doing some other things that are, that are less skillful. The lineage of instruction isn't saying that all of our teachers have to be perfect and without flaws or imperfections. Personally, I don't want a teacher that says they're without flaws or imperfections. I don't trust that. I trust the human frailty. I trust the human condition of people that are sitting and have been sitting where each of us have been, that have flaws and imperfections, that make mistakes, that sometimes show unskillful ways, but also show us the possibility of continual practice, the possibility of practice realization. So without faith, we can get stuck in the flaws and imperfections, and we can think, oh, I don't know about that. But the lineage is not saying all of the ancestors were without imperfections or unskillful at times. Everyone is working to overcome the kleshas, the delusions, the obstacles to realizing bodhicitta, to realizing emptiness, to, to be able to realize our life as it's unfolding right here now, being intimate with that encounter where there's no separation. There's no I, there's no you, there's no me, there's no other. It's all of us together. Don't you think of the lineage as one big Indra's net? Supporting us, these beautiful jewels that are interspersed at sort of the, the junctions of the, of the nets. Our ancestors catching us. Okay, we're going to fall. But who catches us? Indra's net. We're part of that. We're part of that. It's Indra's net. Our ancestors. How do we repay their kindness? When someone is generous to you in a very, I don't mean to be demeaning, but in a very sort of, you know, ordinary way, maybe they give you a little gift, and we think, oh, that was so nice. And, and we kind of think of ways that we can repay their kindness. Well, what, what can I do for you? How, how can I help you? 
But can you imagine? Like, this is the grand scale of repayment of kindness. <laughs> this is the grand scale. How do we repay the living lineage of ancestors? What can we do now, in this life, in this moment, to repay our ancestors for always catching us in Indra's net? Oh, oh, oh. I need like one of those buzzers, you know, like they do in sports events. Like, ah, fourth quarter, get going, you'll get to. So Dogen Zenji, Dogen Zenji says that because our life is this, we have the opportunity to attain realization. It's not, it's not such some far-flung notion. He said, we do not practice in order to attain realization. In fact, when we practice, we do not need to ex expect anything. Our practice is this realization. It's already here. Our life is this wisdom. Our, our practice is this realization. So I want to read the last little paragraph in this, in this section on appreciate your life. Where Maizumi Roshi says, I encourage you, please enjoy this wonderful life together. Appreciate the world of just this. There is nothing extra. Genuinely appreciate your life as the most precious treasure and take good care of it. Thank you. So we do have about five or so minutes left, if anyone has questions or comments. Yeah, that was a home run. Thank you, this is Hogetsu. Uh, one of the things that, that really struck me is the reminder that I am part of a lineage and I am transmitting that lineage in each moment of my life. And I thank you so much for that. That was just uh, really a little piece of, of um, my understanding of being part of, of, this, of this lineage. And I think it'll make a difference tomorrow when we do service to say, I'm part of that. Beautiful Thank words. You so Thank you Beautiful so much. Beautiful words. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Well, uh, I'm so touched that you talked about Maizumi Roshi this way, Milgetsu. Uh, none of us would be here if it wasn't for Maizumi Roshi. Uh, uh, have a hard time talking about him without crying, but he had um, the kind of difficulties he had just to bring the Dharma from Japan to America. Uh, we can't even conceive of what he went through, but he didn't really understand us that. I mean, he did. On some level, he understood us, but he didn't understand us uh, in many ways. And he was always, yeah, he said, why do, why do so many Americans don't like their parents? I don't mm. understand. He couldn't understand that because he loved his, you know, he loved his mother. Like you said, he took his mother's name, yeah. but we wouldn't be here. We absolutely would not be here if it wasn't for his aspiration and the, the depth of his love for the Dharma. And uh, he, he, in a way, his family suffered because he was so uh, committed to the Dharma that he would do a lot of other things. Yeah. Uh, and that's not uncommon, but you know, Kanjo wouldn't be here if it weren't for Maizumi. He came to this center because he read that book after his husband died. So uh, we're all here because of Maizumi. And I'm just so touched that you talked about him this way today. Thank you. 
You know, spend some time when you come into the center, when you come into the center, uh, at the Founder's Altar. It's, it's so inspiring to just really spend some time looking, showing gratitude, saying thanks, appreciating their kindness, their generosity, as Roshi said. None of us would be here without their kindness, without the kindness of our teachers, Roshi and Sensei, bringing, bringing forth this beautiful zendo to practice in. So any out the door comments before we, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, you had me crying and falling over with laughter. Uh, really, <laughs> really beautiful teaching. Uh, I started out with the session with uh, five books. And after your talk yesterday, I now have eight that I probably got to get <laughs> five minutes to read. But uh, something that I always go back to, uh, I don't know much about my Zumi Roshi, but when Joko Beck was asked, why did she get involved in Zen? She said, she was out for the evening with a friend, a woman, a sort of hard-boiled business type, and we decided to hear a talk by Maizumi Roshi. As we went in, he bowed to each person and looked right at us. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely direct contact. When we sat down, my friend said to me, what was that? He wasn't doing anything special, except for once, Somebody was paying attention. Hmm. It's just the simple things. It's just the simple things. It's just, thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Sangha. Um, look forward, anything else? I look forward to sharing the rest of I, Oh, sorry, Jackie. Go ahead. Um, I would like to say that I was um, sitting last night and I was in so much physical pain. And I was just saying to myself, what am I doing? You know, what? You know, what? I, what what am I doing? Shared your talk this morning. You're you're freezing, Jackie, unfortunately. Oh sorry. You're going in and out, sorry. Yeah, it's too bad. Jackie, you, you broke up and we, I think we got the sense of what you were saying, but we, we didn't, weren't yeah. able to hear all the words, but we heard your heart. Yeah, definitely. Thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you in the next several days. And certainly during Ango, I know most of you are joining us if not all, for Ango, and I really look forward to practicing with all of you and spending time uh, with the precious Dharma. Thank you.